You learned the last. See the word in this. Share pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Fathers, once again we come to you as humbly as we know how, dear Lord. Dear Lord, just thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to wake up and see another beautiful day, dear Lord, and a beautiful sunset. Dear Lord, we always thank you for all the blessing you have restored before us, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we ask to forgive us any sins we might commit against you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are sick and afflicted, dear Lord. We pray for those who are grieving from death in the families and friends, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we just pray for those throughout the world, dear Lord, not just because of the pandemic, dear Lord, but there's so many people going through so many things in so many parts of the world, we don't, we can't even imagine what they're going through, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you, dear Lord, for that 10-year-old girl that got kidnapped in Louisiana, that they caught the guy um, before he harmed her, dear Lord. Um, usually that, that story always ends in, in, in a bad way. Uh, dear Lord, but we just, you had your hands safety around her, dear Lord, that she was able to get rescued before anything happened to her. Dear Lord, we want to pray for all those in the church, dear Lord. We pray that we continue to strive to do the things that we should be doing. And dear Lord, and that we continue to speak the same things and mind the same rules so there'll be no division among the church, dear Lord. And dear Lord, as we go on the, uh, tonight for the study, we pray that the things that can be said and heard, dear Lord, that it, it may continue to help us grow, dear Lord, that we may get understanding of your word, that we may be deliver the good news to others, dear that's the spring of Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, Saints. Good evening. Busy day again, of course. Always is. Uh, I don't know that I've had too many days where it wasn't busy. <laughs> we want to jump right in. We've been 
going through our studies of the book of Job, and we're, I don't want to say winding down, I might want to say we're winding up, because God is going to be speaking pretty soon, and so we want to proceed through our study and just take a look at where we're at right now. Where, where we're at, we're in uh, Elihu. Elihu speaks to Job and his friends. We're in part three, Job chapter number 32 through 37. And as we go through the slides, we will see that, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, just for those that might, you know, come in uh, either late or while we're in the middle of a, a session, I like to always kind of give people an overview of where we're at. Uh, we'll, we see that uh, uh, the beginning of Job and then Job's being depressed and then the rounds of cycles from verse chapter 24 through 25 and Right now we're in uh, chapter 32 through 37. We just finished chapters 26 through 31. And in fact, tonight we'll be starting in chapter 34. The way it's going to round out the portion where Elihu is cross-examining Job is we kind of went through 31 and 33 where Elihu was angry with Job and he was angry with his friends and his desire to speak. And then he was starting to give his response to Job, which we're kind of in the middle of that right now. But then as we end, or as he ends, he starts talking about the goodness and the majesty of God. So Elihu's appeal to listen, in the beginning he asked a series of questions. Not in the beginning, but actually if you go through Elihu's discourse, you'll see a series of questions uh, not even questions, I'm sorry, where he wants to be heard. He's a young man, and he's come in late to the discussion. He wants to be heard. So in Job 32, 9 and 10, he says, Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Therefore, I said, hearken to me, I also will show mine opinion. In 32, 17, he says, I said, I will answer also my part. I also will show mine opinion, for I am full of matter. The spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine, which hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. And he continues, he says, I will speak, then I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man. For I know not to give flattering titles, and so doing, my maker would soon take me away." In chapter 33, verse number one, wherefore, Job, I pray thee, hear my speeches and hearken to all my words. Behold, now I have opened my mouth, my tongue hath spoken in my mouth. My words shall be of the uprightness of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge. We go down to chapter 33, verse four and five. The Spirit of God hath made me, and hath breath of the Almighty hath given me life. If thou canst answer me, set thy words in order for me. Stand up. Chapter 34, verse 1 and 2. Furthermore, Elihu answered and said, hear my words. You're noticing a pattern here, and that's why we went to these specific scriptures. Because he says, furthermore, Elihu answered and said, hear my words, o, o, o ye wise men, and give ear unto me, ye that have knowledge. Therefore, hearken unto me, ye men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty, that he should commit iniquity. 32, 15, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn against unto the dust. If thou hast understanding, hear this, hearken to the voice of my words. 36, 1, Elihu also proceeded and said, suffer me a little, and I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar, and will ascribe righteousness to my maker. Brother Keith, I think we were talking about that passage. So the reason why I went through that first is because there's a series of passages spread out where Elihu is asking Job and the friends to listen. Listen to me. Hear me out. Listen to me. And that's what we kind of went through. So now we're going to briefly start going through some more of his response. And we noted at the end of 33, this is where we kind of left off. He says, Mark well, O Job, hearken unto me. Hold thy peace, and I will speak. If thou hast anything to say, answer me. Speak, 
For I desire to justify thee. If not, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee wisdom. Before we get in, uh, we noticed a little bit about Elihu's character. Does anybody have any thoughts about that before we go on? I, I just gave a bunch of scriptures, and I hope that if we were kind of going through them, and I know they kind of went real fast, but if you go back, there might have been some things you were, you were able to pick up about this young man, some qualities about this young man. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments on what uh, we just read right now? Brother Keith. For one, uh, he's talking a lot about the spirit, mm -hmm. and he's also talking about wisdom. Yes, sir. We understand that he's a descendant from Abraham, uh, I think the second nephew, and he went through probably everything that Abraham went through and seen a lot of God. That's why he could talk a lot about spirit. But when I looked up that one verse, and I believe it was 30, 35, I, I don't have my Bible on me. Uh, he talked about that he is uh, full of wisdom. And I kind of, if Bible doesn't say if he got that from God or if he got that from man, but I looked it up a little bit and it talks about who he, his birth line is from. And I believe... He talks about the knowledge that he has was from observing his uncles and his dad as they traveled through the land. So I kind of don't see Elihu in the eyes of everybody else as being this young uh, on fire guy. I see him that, but he has missed the whole point of what's going on, just as the rest of Job's friends. This is a test on Job. No one has put their finger on that yet. No one has said, oh, Job. Elihu is now on him talking about the chastisement of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's not given a reason why the chastisement is. His reason for the chastisement is that Elihu, I mean, Job, excuse me, has still done something wrong. Mm -hmm. He hasn't said, oh, the Lord has, the Lord is. He hasn't said that. He only is referring to the response that Job has given mm -hmm. under the duress the that he's under. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's about it. Anybody have any thoughts on what Brother Keith said? You can grab a mic, Brother. You can grab a mic. Sorry for being late for number one, but I grasped something different. Like he says, Mark well, O Job. And it's like he's saying, you know, hold up, wait a minute, just listen, take a moment and watch what I'm getting ready to say. Because from that moment, even though it doesn't say so, it's like God is working through him. Where he used to work through Job, now God is working through this young man. And like I said last week, if you look at it, it says, hearken to me, hold thy peace, and I will speak. If I has anything to say, answer me. Now, when he says that, he says, let me talk. And after that, you can answer. You can, you know, but I have something I have to say. What he says is here after that. He says, speak, for I desire to justify thee. Yeah, that's, this, that's the same. Uh, if that's not this one, it's one of the texts I went to before. But you're right. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, what Let's, I'm saying is we look mm -hmm. at Elihu. I mean, he's the young man. He sh he's not coming at him like the rest of them came, came, came at him. As far as you've done something, you know you're wrong, and you're saying he's trying to say, "Wait, hold, up, wait a minute, step back for a minute. Just, 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 just hold your horses. There's something you're missing here." Yes. So that's pretty much how I see it. He's he's trying to uh, win him over, like Brother Keith said, because of the fact of his heritage and what line he comes from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a big difference in so when someone comes in and they're <laughs> accusing you of doing something. He's not accusing him. He's just saying, hey, let me speak. Let me say what I have to say. And then, answer, then you answer me. Mm -hmm. But Tony. When I look at Elihu, I see that, once again, we know he's young from the story, uh, the way that he addresses the older man, the respect that he has shown. 
But in this time also, his heart is churning from what he's hearing. I think when we look at it and look at his opening statement, he told the friends, you have not answered Job's answer. And I think that when we look toward Job, when we're going back over in the 33rd verse, once again, he's revealing, but without going into too much, he says, and, um, and I've heard thy voice of thy words that Job was saying, I am clean without transgression. Job is saying, I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. He says, but now, behold, he, and the he is referring to, to me, is God. But behold, he, God, findeth occasion against me. He counted me for his enemy. And, and, and not that, once again, when I look at Job, the, he's just reciting the words that Job has said. And he said, he putteth my feet in stocks. He marketh up my path. Behold, now um, Elihu is saying, behold, in this, behold, in this, Job, you, thou art not just, is what he's saying. You know, when he's talking to him, he says, and I will answer thee. He says that God is greater than man. And so I think, once again, when we look at this, Elihu and his, like you said, when you look at it, he appears to be a righteous man. He appears to be, uh, to have that um, sense, what Job, you know, like when, when Job was talking about how he would counsel. Mm -hmm. But now Elihu is providing some counseling. And he's providing some counseling to help Job. Just as we recall back, Job said, I would have comfort you. Even looking in his speech, he says, look, don't be afraid. I'm not trying to put you down. I mean, you know, and I'm paraphrasing this. Yeah. But he's telling Job, once again, he's trying to give Job some comfort. Yeah. He's trying to have Job to look at this. Mm -hmm. Now, look, the, the, the thing is, is that although you said that, and you're innocent, and you've gone through all these things, mm -hmm. once again, it, it, it is inferring, and I'm just reading what he says here when you said mm -hmm. that you are not just. Mm -hmm. He didn't say he sinned. He just said you're not just. <laughs> in your, your, your view here of what you see. And I yes. think Elihu is trying to show him that. Yes, amen. I, I, amen. amen. I think in, in its totality, what we are learning, brethren, is how we interact with a brother or sister that's going through some struggles. Re regardless of what the struggles is, X marks the spot. Marital issues, financial issues, health issues, faith issues, children issues, whatever that is, what we're learning about is how do we be our brother's keeper? How do we relate? How do we have empathy? How do we slow down and not just go in like a raging bull into someone else's life and begin to accuse them, begin to blame them, begin to uh, so-called put our finger on the spot as if we know everything. And by this discourse with Job and his friends, we're finding out, and I hope that we are learning about patience, about love, about understanding, about our very approach in a Christ-like fashion when we're dealing with people that are struggling. I, my own personal view is, I, I heard it a little bit, but I tend to think that Elihu is a good man. And, and I think that Elihu really is trying to help Job. As to his friends who came under the cloak of helping, but were very accusatory. Remember, Elihu, what he's saying is, Job, in one thing you're not right. And that one thing is that in your sorrow, in the weight of your struggle, in your pain, in your agony, you have affronted God because you've been so amped up about getting an answer and God is still quiet. 
Now you're like on the edge of becoming self-righteous. I, 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 I. Remember chapter 31. That's where Elihu is coming in and saying, okay, Job, slow down a little bit. In this, you're not right. He's not coming in like the buddies and just said that, you know, you're, not, you're beating out your, 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 your hired people, you know, you, you're stingy. You know, they had all these reasons why Job was studying, uh-oh, was, was sinning. So let's go on and continue to read. Let's get into uh, chapter 34 because I think that'll open it up a little bit. We might go all the way through chapter 20, 37 tonight. Uh, we'll try, but we won't rush it. Furthermore, this is Job 34. Furthermore, Elihu answered and said, Hear my words, O ye wise men, and give ear unto me, ye that have knowledge. For the ear trieth words, and the mouth hasteth, tasteth meat. Let us choose, let us choose to use, just use judgment. Let us know among others, other, okay, slow down. Let us choose to use judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job has said, I am righteous, and God hath taken away my judgment. Should I lie against my right, my wound is incurable without transgression. What man is like Job, who drinketh up scorning like water, which goeth in company with the workers of iniquity, and walketh with wicked men? For he hath said, it profited a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. Therefore hearken unto me, ye men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. For the work of a man shall he render unto him, and cause every man to find according to his ways. Yea, surely will God, God will not do wickedly, Neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. Remember, we already studied this. Remember the, the question back in chapter number eight. Does God pervert judgment? That was a question that was asked by one of his friends. Verse 13. Who have given him a charge? Who has given him a charge over the earth? This is, to me, kind of a, a, a groundwork, if you will, of what God says to Job in chapter number 38. This is why I believe that Elihu was onto something, because when God does speak, he takes Job to task. Therefore, there must have been something in Job's attitude that caused God to kind of stand up. God said, wait a minute, Job, you're going too far. You're still my man. You're still my buddy. You're still my boy. I still love you, but you're going too far now, Job. Let me take you on a tour and ask where you were. Verse 14. If he set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto the dust. I looked that one up. It is Genesis. Let's see. Genesis 3.19. Genesis 3.19. Somebody has that and can read that for us real quick. I'll continue to read verse 16. If now thou hast understanding, hear this, hearken to the voice of my words. Shall even he that hath right govern, and wilt thou condemn he that is most just? In other words, just because you're right in something, are you the ultimate judge? Are you the ultimate authority? Are you the ultimate one that gets to have the final say? Sometimes we have a propensity, good or bad, right or wrong, uh, to be known as people that are argumentative. And sometimes we just want to be right. We just want to be right. Never mind the damage that we could be doing in our rightness, if that's even a, a way to explain it. But since we have a propensity to want to be right, we make ourselves the judge. And this is what uh, Elihu is saying. Verse 17, shall even he that hath right govern, and wilt thou condemn him that is most just? He's talking about God. He says, wait a minute, Job, you're, you're saying you're right. You're holding on to your righteousness. But are you going to hold on to your righteousness so much that you're going to now say that God is unjust? This is what 
Elihu's issue with Job is, is that he's clinging on to that, to that righteousness. Verse 19, how much less to him that accepteth not the person of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor, for they all, the, for they all are the work of his hands. He's talking about God. In a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight and pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away without hand. I looked that one up too. And uh, that's where we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in the twinkling of an eye. So Elihu is saying, wait a minute, you are professing to be so right, but you're just a man. You're just human. Even though you have your sorrows, even though you have your arguments, even though you, know, you may be right in what you're saying, but my issue again with you, Job, is that you tend to be taking it too far. Any thoughts or comments where we're at so far? No, but did you want Genesis read? Sorry again? I said no, but did you want Genesis? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Genesis, <laughs> let, me, let me go back to uh, Job, uh, was that Job 34, 15. Um, and he says, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto dust. Genesis 3.19, in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto the dust shall thou return. Then he goes on, when I say he, Heliu, Heliu if you go back, the very next passage, he says, If now thou hast understanding, hear this, hearken to the voice of my words. Shall even he that hateth right govern? And will thou condemn him that is most just? On my notes, I, you probably can't see it here, but I went through and highlighted all of the questions that Elihu asked Job. I was going to go through those just as a summary. I, I wanted to go through all the questions. But when you look at what he's asking, it gives insight to what his thinking is. Because just by the nature and character of his questions, you could see that he's not necessarily condemning Job, but he's asking Job, have you considered God? Have you placed your trust in God? We know Job has, but right now Job is in a different place. Job is saying, wait a minute, uh, God, this is not right. I'm, I've been five and a half months here now. This is, uh, I'm, I'm getting tired. I'm getting fed up. I'm stuck in this situation. These boils are killing me. I can't sleep at night. I was a good man. I, I, I paid my servants. I didn't cheat. I didn't lust after women. I didn't do all these things. Why am I suffering? And if I did something wrong, tell me. Let me know. Let me hear something. And so I, I hesitate to fault Job. I hesitate because I'm not fully in his shoes. But I try to put myself there as best as I can. Because when we see him struggling and we see this, the things that he says, it's easy for us to kind of just looking at the text, condemn Job, not in a way that his friends are, but just say, come on, Job, what's the matter with you? Straighten up. You can do it. Rah, rah. It's easy for us to say that. But when we are living with, let's just say if it was a, a, a cancer. If it was something, and I don't know how many of you guys have ever been through a situation in your life where you've been up in the middle of the night and you were crying. You tried to cry yourself to sleep. You tried to pray. Your friends, your mom, your dad, your cousins, all the people that were consoling you earlier in the day, they're gone home now. It's nobody but you and the pillow. You and your thoughts, you and God. And so this is where Job is. This is where he is at the lowest point of his faith. And for me, you, any of us to just outright condemn him for the things he says, I think it's, 
it, it's, it's where we need to learn some more about just this whole story about Job so that we can then, again, have more empathy for people that are going through some things that, you know, on the surface, it's like, okay, what are you talking about, man? You know, straighten up. You, you, you could do it. Why is he, why is he still struggling with this? Why is she still dealing with that? And we kind of right off the bat want to just, okay, say a prayer for him and we go about our lives when this person is still dealing with whatever they're dealing with. But we just kind of nonchalantly move on and that's the nature of Job. He's living in this. Brother Tony. I, I was just going to say, sitting here listening, um, and you've already hit on some of it. You know, we can take from this. Here, look, Job's friends. How instead of trying to comfort, you came to blame. Some of it is in our ignorance, our lack of understanding, or whatever. But um, given that when we see something wrong, our mindset automatically goes to you did something wrong. You know, uh, people seeing people. You know, and, and especially when you look back then. If you had a child that was deaf or you had all these things happening to you, they took that as a sign that there was something that you had done wrong. Mm -hmm. And they're coming from this in the wisdom of what they've seen in the wisdom of man's eyes. Mm -hmm. um, we can look at you were saying where Job is and me thinking about what Elihu was saying is Job, it's not that you're unrighteous, but in it you're unjust in your portion to God, allocating things to God, which God, like he, look, uh, I'm not wicked. I'm not, you know, I'm, you know, these things God just doesn't naturally do. And I, and so it made us, you know, me think about us. Sometimes things happen to us and the same thing that Job wants, we want. We want answers from God. Yes. And sometimes we tend to do the same thing. Even though we have this story, we tend to blame God because we don't understand. You know, and I think that if we can take anything from it, it's to learn where he said, hey, look, God is not we evil. Mm -hmm. You know, so don't put my blame toward God, but more or less, let me trust in God. Let me ask and continue to pray, God, mm -hmm. help me out of this. If, even if I have some bad thought here, let, you know, let me have a different mindset of God because uh, I think in the end, when, 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 when God begins to speak to Job, Job even has a clearer understanding of what, what and who God is. Mm -hmm. At that point, mm -hmm. he just knows the blessings and things that has come. But now here, like you said, he, he, he's not that he, he doesn't have trust in God because he's shown that even through all that he has said. But he hasn't really truly been giving God his due just of saying, here, look, mm -hmm. this is the kind, this is God. God would not be wicked. God would not do these things. Mm -hmm. But Job, I'm going to say from my perspective, is saying, here, look, I know God. And who can stand against God that God, if God wants to do these things, he will do them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as we go along, we find out that, no, that's not God, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think that that's the thing that we can take away from it in saying, not only more or less trying to look at, this is from Job, Job from Job, but what is God trying to reveal to me? Amen. To build me up as a person, mm -hmm. to give me strength, to give me trust in God. You know, so that when he said, though he slay me, you know, and I think, well, that, I can't remember, that may have been Dave, but though he slay me, yet, you know, I and can't say it quite, I will not deny him, or, you know, I'm going to put my trust in God. Amen. No matter what happens, mm -hmm. I'm going to put my trust and my faith in God. Amen, amen, amen. But the, um, kind of what I get from it when they say, you know, God is not wicked, um, the couple of months that I've been coming to Bible study, everything about the Lord and, and, and about the Word is about teaching. And to piggyback off of what Brother Tony was saying, whenever something happened to us, it's, God, why are you punishing me? 
what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Why are you punishing me? And what I feel that they mean when they say God is not wicked, he's not punishing you. He doesn't punish us. He disciplines us. You know, everything that he has in store for us, everything that we go through, they're teaching moments. He's putting us through trials and tribulations for us to learn. And I think that's what Elihu is trying to get everyone to understand. It's like, we need to learn. There's a message here. This is not a punishment. This is not an act of wickedness. This is, he's trying to teach us something. Go ahead. Oh, and that's kind of, that's where my mindset is going right now as I'm listening to this. I think Elihu is just saying that, look, you need to, what are you learning? You need to learn something from this. There's something that you're not doing right, so you need to, you know, I don't know, figure out what it is or, <laughs> you know. You are speaking to, it's a theory. Uh -huh. You are speaking to a theory that if what you said is just true, is true, I'm sorry, and God is not wicked, then there is actually a purpose for Job going through this. Mm -hmm. And that theory we talked about a couple of weeks ago was that Job had some pride in him that he didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And so him learning this mm -hmm. is to expunge that pride or expose that pride right. so that Job could then learn from it. If, if you know, you're going with that theory, I, I don't know that the whole story of Job necessarily teaches it that succinctly. But there, there are some people that have studied Job and they believe that that was one of the theories as to why. In other words, to answer the why, because if you don't have an answer to the why, then it makes God look like he's mean. Right. Because he allowed Job to suffer for nothing. So the, the answer or the theory is that there was something in Job that he wasn't aware of, and this process brought it out, and Job was able to learn from it, because we'll see when he's restored at the end, you know, God, you know, basically put his whole life back together. But Jim, oh, I'm sorry, what's this? Yes, yeah, so one of the things I've, I've taken away from this, um, and you can clarify, with Job, has he ever been used to the silence? Because going on what Tony was saying, a lot within us, when God is silent mm -hmm. and we don't hear from God, mm -hmm. and then we start the why me, why this, mm -hmm. God's just been silent. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's to make us aware and sit and think. Mm -hmm. Now, I was looking through my verses and with what Job's going through, there's always a saying that try, I try to get through, try to help me, and I'm just thinking about Job. God will never give you more than you can handle. Amen. So Amen. Job, even though he's testing you, yeah. he knows how much you can handle. Yeah. And he told Satan, just don't kill you. Yeah. But he knows how much you can handle. Job, to me, is kind of saying... I don't know, I'm giving up. I, I, I know I really can handle it, but I, I'm just tired. I don't want to do yeah. it anymore. <laughs> but yeah. God is saying, no, I know how far you can go. Yes. And I'm yes. going to make you go as far. And that's yes. how I feel sometimes with us t in today's world mm -hmm. is that we want to blame God, mm -hmm. but he's, just give it, he's not going to give you more than we cannot handle because God is not an unjust God. He's Amen. not a wicked God, Amen. but he's not going to make it easy. And I think mm -hmm. dealing with our kids as well, it's like they always want things easy. Mm. And when Joel and I are trying to tell the kids, it's no, we're, we're backing off to let you kids learn and focus on yourself and grow. And we as parents become silent. Yes. We see our kids. Come just, on now. Yeah, we see our kids just Amen. start losing their mind. Amen. And he's the one that's taught me that sometimes we just got to be silent. We don't say anything. We just let them hit their head against the wall and were silent. And that's how I see God. And I think, and Elihu is reminding me of Paul. When Paul was out there first trying to teach and trying to speak about God, and Paul was just trying to tell everybody to listen. And Paul was giving, you know, his take on things. 
and people were, you know, not listening to Paul. But I, I just feel like God's just been silent with Job, and Job is just not listening that God's there, but he's silent. Yeah. And Job was just getting beat down. But that's how I feel about it. You know why I'm smiling, Julie? No. <laughs> Because you talked about your own kids and my like some of my parenting started to just flash through my life. We grew up we grew up poor. Yeah. We grew up so poor that brother keep laughing, that you were so hungry your stomach shriveled up and was touching your back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had no food and you know, mm -hmm. we red beans and rice, uh we, we talk about fried bologna sandwiches. Mm -hmm. We couldn't afford candy. We made candy. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> and so I grew up with an attitude of because I felt hunger, and just to drive it home just to another second, there was one time when I was a, a, a little boy, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old, we had nothing to eat, nothing, nothing. And I went down to my mom, I was crying. It was like 9 or 10 o'clock at night. My mom just hugged me and kissed me. She said, baby, we just don't have nothing. I mean, nothing. So I went and drank water. And I went up into my bed and I lay down. I was crying. It was so hungry. It's a, it's a different pain. And I swore to myself that if I ever have kids, I was never going to allow them to be hungry, to experience that pain. And so when I grew up and became a father, I kind of went too far the other way. My, <laughs> my kids had... It might not have been filet mignon or steak or rib, but there was always food to the point to where they started to waste it. You have half-eaten bowls of cereal. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're going through gallons of milk, mm -hmm. wasted, mm -hmm. and then I start getting hot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I cut back. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I would go and I would shop on a budget, like yeah. every family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just a straight line shopper. Boom, 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 boom. Bring it home. And then my wife said, oh, they don't like that. They're not going to eat this. They're not gonna... I said, watch them eat it. Yeah. <laughs> They'll eat it. And then, you know, it might take a few days, but then stuff starts disappearing. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> so this is where you're saying how God is just sitting back. So mm -hmm. sometimes I would buy the food and I would sit back mm -hmm. and let them taste or feel what it needs, what it means to struggle. Yeah. What it means to have to earn something, what it means to appreciate the dinner that mom fixes, no matter what it is, even if you had it three nights in a row, it's better than nothing. See, we grew up totally opposite. So I, didn't, I never understood when Gerald used to say, because he was like you, he made sure, he used, to, he used to sweat if you could see the back of the refrigerator, because he was like, go buy some food. <laughs> But then the kids started wasting it. And then <clears throat> as the kids grew up, I remember he, he started like, no, I'm, you know, we're going to get the cheap bread and we're going to get the cheap meat and the cheap cheese. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, the kids are not going to eat it. And, and, and cereal with no name. And, yeah. he was like, and I was like, they're not going to eat it. And he's like, watch. <laughs> and I used to feel bad. I'm and with then, you, bro. And then whenever they said they were hungry, he would be like, you don't know hunger pains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was what, when he started like, you know, stepping back and, then I would always go pick him up from school, and he was like, let him ride the bus. <laughs> Amen. Like, yeah. And then I never Amen. forget when it was raining, pouring, and he was like, don't go get him. Let him ride the bus. And I'm like, it's raining. He was like, and? <laughs> so it's, it's when you have to, as a parent, he was the one who taught me that sometimes as a parent, you got to be silent yes. and just look at them. Yes. You're never going to let any, he always yes. says, I'll never let them, be, I'll never let them hurt themselves. And my kids will never be able to, like, you know, when my kids, like, slam the door and say, I'm leaving home, Gerald will be like, bye. Yeah. But he'll be like, my kids will never sleep on the street. I'll always yeah. have a home for my kids. But I have to, we as a parent, we need to step back. And sometimes we need to be silent and let them go through things. Amen. And I think that's what is what God was doing with, with Joe. Yes, yes. Cause he, because me and Gerald talked about that. He always said, I'll never, never just leave don't kill you him. Or yeah. Forsake you. Yeah, yeah, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Mm -hmm. And he told the devil, don't kill him. That's right. And that's, right. The, that's the one thing I, I it, in, I'm in awe of the devil in the sense that 
Because the, the devil, I would have thought, would have said, now nah, I'm just going to kill him anyway. <laughs> 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 but he never, because he probably know the wrath of God. Yeah. But um, the fact that the devil just did all of this, and sometimes we, with us, when we go through things, we have to go through it. Like you said, we have to learn from it. Yeah. And this last year, I had to be silent, sit still, and I had to learn, and it was the woe be me. I've done this, I've done It's I, 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 I. Mm. Mm -hmm. And just going through this, you, you hear on me, eyes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. Brother Jimmy's had his hand up for a minute. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, yeah get a mic, brother. This, this, is, this is good. This is application. <laughs> I, just, I just see how the story of Job is, is really a comfort story for us. Because it gives you the ups and downs and peeps and, and, and valleys. But, but his mostly valleys, you know. But in, in the end, it, it shows you. It really goes back to Roman uh, 828. All things work together for good for those who are called to his, for his purpose. You know, and, and, and when our lives, we, we go through ups and downs. But if you just remember that scripture, well, whatever's happening now is working for the better for me somewhere down the line. Because the scripture said it is, all things work together for good. I can't figure it out right now, I'm on the midst of the storm. But I know God don't lie, my promise is, it's going to be better for me somewhere down the road. So I just weather the storm and look for the, the goodness of it and everything. And, and so that's, you know, for those who are, you know, calling on the, of God's purpose. Now, if you're doing that, doing wrong and stuff, you know, that's a whole different story. But if you faithful, because you... Bible said we're going to be persecuted. We're going to go through some trials and tribulations. Yeah. But uh, just with that verse right there, you know the Lord got your back. Yes. Even with yes. vengeance. Yes. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Amen. You know, Amen. so he got, us, he got us in the back end and the front, actually. Amen. Yeah, so. Amen. Brother Gerald. I still can't take my mind off of how Job got there. He got there because that shy, uh, what would you call it, shifty person was telling God I was going to and fro. I'm that's doing what, what I want. That's what Brother Keith was saying. Yeah, I'm going doing all this and I'm doing it because I say, God told. Yeah. So to me personally, he's showing us patience and stepping away from his chosen vessel, which was used to everything given to him. Mm. 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 Why, 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 did Satan, why did Satan say he couldn't give him the first time, Brother Keith? He said, you got a hedge around him. That's why I can't get to Job. You know, he's your man. You, you got this barrier. You, you said you left that barrier. Let me touch his bones, he says, and I'll get him. One more, one more uh, part of uh, what we were talking about about sometimes how parents have to step back. And I think this is important because it talks about God's silence to Job. And I, I'm probably going to get in trouble, Brother Tony. <laughs> but I'm going to kind of share it anyway. But it's a personal story. Uh, we got a call last week with my daughter. She's in college. And um, she, was, she was crying. She's going, you know, just tough times with school and, you know, just everything, you know, she's kind of stressed out and, you know, all the assignments do and just a lot of pressure, you know, if, if you're if you're in college. And I felt that her, let me back up, we had that kind of stand off a little bit, let her grow, let her do her things. You know, if she needed her breaks done, you know, we help, you know, we help in little ways, but she has to grow. But this time, not that she was like Job, I don't want to put her in the same boat as Job, but I could tell this time it was different. And so I, and talked to my wife, I said, yeah, I think, yeah, it might be a good idea for you to go visit her. So we talked about that, we talked about COVID, we talked about the concerns, we talked about the dangers, we talked about precautions, we talked about everything. But there is a time is where I was going where the parents do step in. And just as God is silent right now, when God shows up, he shows out. All of a sudden, all the stuff that was behind you, God just, whew, 
He just wipes it all away. And it's almost like you have a clean slate. You have a new uh, beginning. You have a new, you know, new hope. You're, you're renewed in your spirit. And so as we uh, just look a little bit, I wanted to end tonight talking about the righteousness of God, because that is where Elihu is going. That's where he's trying to steer Job's focus. So if you can open your Bibles to the book of Romans, <clears throat> Romans chapter number one. And uh, Paul, when he was writing, or he actually didn't write it, but when the Roman letter, uh, Paul had yearned to visit Rome. And uh, he was, at this time, not in Rome. You know, he went there later, but he was, you know, in a Mamertine dungeon. But when the Roman letter was written, he was talking about how he wanted to go to Rome, and he was impressing to them how much... He was not ashamed of the gospel. If you remember, uh, Rome, the city proper itself, it had more servants and slaves than it had Roman citizens because they were the wealthiest nation on the planet and everybody had slaves and servants. So there was a lot of slaves and servants. So you had a mix of cultures. Um, and in Rome, remember, uh, Judaism was one of the legal uh, religions. You could legally practice Judaism as long as you paid your taxes and you respect the Caesar or whatever. But that's why when Paul was writing to them, uh, he opens up the letter talking about him being a bond slave. And you can, you, you can read his language and he was telling he was trying to reach a certain audience. But he says in there, Romans 1, 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And be, that was because you had the uh, ostracization, if that's the right word, by the Roman officials and the hierarchy and Zeus. They worship the Hellenist gods of the Greek because of Greek influence. And then on the other side, you had Judaism. And then outside of that, you had all forms of paganism. So the Christians in Rome were a very small group. And some of them were ashamed of the gospel. They were afraid to speak up for Christ. That's why Paul said in Romans 1, 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He was talking about them. But we noticed that once he talked about the gospel being the power to salvation, Romans 1, 18, he does a hard pivot because he immediately says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So in here, Paul begins to open up about the righteousness of God. And in fact, if we go back to verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for in it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God which encompasses his grace, which encompasses his mercy, which encompasses his love, but it also includes his justice. We don't like to talk about that. So that's why Paul immediately goes to the wrath because he says, wait a minute, there's another shoe that's going to drop. And so when we start talking about the righteousness of God Ezra says in Ezra chapter number 9, the verses number 15, O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped, as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. And on this night, I wanted to just open it up to the class in the last couple of minutes if anyone has experienced the righteousness of God, I know we have. 
but if you would like to just share your thoughts and your experiences <coughs> on what God has done for you, and we could keep it to a minute or so, maybe we could just go around and just talk about the goodness of God. Brother Keith, Brother Tony, Sister Leash, Sister Leida, Leida, Jimmy, my brother, anybody want to talk about for a minute just what God has done for them? Because we know you've been through some stuff, but what has God done for you? Brother T. Um, I think God has done truly a lot. Um, I have a wonderful wife. I have wonderful daughters. Um, when I look back and I think that I could have done some things differently, you know, sometimes I look in my life and I look at the world and it's like, this has happened to those people. It could have happened to me. And after, you know, it's kind of like sometimes I feel that God, yeah, he got that hedge around me. <laughs> you know, he's protecting me even when I do something stupid. Um, you know, and but but I try to be grateful of that, try to look back, um, try to grow. Not that I'm perfect. Uh, try to continue to have my faith in God. You know, um, I grew up saying, you know, I think I could have done better as it pertaining to God and my daughters. But mm -hmm. now it's like we talk, and for when I hear them, you know, I, I think the other day we were somewhere, and, and it may have been Kayla. This is nothing but a blessing from the Lord. Amen. You know, and it's just hearing that yes. just makes you feel good. Because, you know, to me, my whole thing was, I don't want to bring kids into this life to lose their life. Because mm -hmm. I understand, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like, I have to be that example. Mm -hmm. I have to put forth mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. trust and stuff mm -hmm. in God. Amen. And so I try to gear us toward that point. And then I think God has not allowed me to suffer, you know, as um, some people have. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, we always have food when I... When I was hearing you guys say that, I was going to say, um, we should even came though, up your house, huh? even, <laughs> even, even though we always have food and I want my kids to always have food, yeah. I tell them, look, because I'm picky. I said, but you can't be picky and not want to suffer. Hmm. You, you know, so what I mean by that is when you get hungry, truly everything tastes good. Uh, it, it does when you get hungry, yeah. but that's what I wanted them to know. Amen. But Keith, I know you got something to say. Yes, ma'am. Me? Yes. Oh, me too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah I do. So, okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, no, I've been truly blessed uh, by God. Um, I just give all praises to him. And last year, uh, this time, in fact, this time last year, I thought I was going to a job. Because I'm always asking for jobs, and then I get the job, and I don't like the job, and I move from the job. But God always gives me a job. Last year, he was like, I'm going to silence you. Because I always give you what you ask for, and then you just, you don't want the job. Last year, I was supposed to go to a job, became unemployed, just as COVID hit. The job fell through. I went all, pretty much most of last year, right up until end of August, without a job. Mm. I interviewed, I kept saying, why me, God, I do everything. It was why me, why me. I was at a low point mm -hmm. and I, God was silent. I couldn't hear him, mm -hmm. couldn't sleep. It was something else. Then we didn't know if we were moving to Texas. We didn't know what we were going to do, where we were going to lay our head. And one thing Gerald always says to me was like, God always makes sure that we have. He always provides for us. So you going through your little temper tantrum right now with God. <laughs> Just, yeah, you yeah, know, just hold on. Just hold on. Hold on. And mm -hmm. what ended up happening was I, Geico called me back with a better position than what I applied for. Amen. Amen. And yeah, and then they just told me the other day that they promoted me again. Amen. And then all of a sudden we were leaving California because we didn't think we could afford a home in California, yeah. let alone live in California. Yeah. And the house that we were renting came up. God blessed us. It's, it's all praise thank, God. Praise God going through. Amen. And it's like, Amen. Gerald was like, these are the blessings. And, and so that's why I said, I just, I have to give him praise. Because he always comes through. Mm -hmm. But he will silence you. And yes. he silenced me last yes. year. And my relationship with God, I got close to him. 
even though we we argued and we we fussed and fight because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. like, you know, why me? Yes, but the blessings were there. Yes, so that's why I just want to give praise. Amen. Anyone else? Has God been good to you? Yes, brother. I don't want to take this any further out because I look back when everybody was saying how hungry they were, and it's not a competition of how hungry you were. Mm-hmm. I reflect back on we had to move in with Tony and him to eat their food. We were young because we just my mother couldn't afford to feed feed us. Mm-hmm. And you know, I sit back, and that was a blessing. My uncle was a true blessing for me at a time in the youth years to get past mm-hmm. and have some stability so I can finish school and I can be blessed, like Tony said, with my wife. Mm-hmm. Because without her, I still would have been an incessant fool of the world. Mm-hmm. I give God credit first. But I give all my blessings because I always tell her mm-hmm. when it comes to morally High marks. She's the most morally, more person I've met in my life. You know, Amen. Not, you know, me like I said. You know, me like I said. We be in clubs and all kind of things. She was patient with me. Yes. Mm-hmm. And God has truly blessed me by rendering me and moving me away from the dirt that I was hanging around. So. Amen. Amen. Brother James. <clears throat> <laughs> Brother <But Jim. laughs> Jim. Well, I, I really never had. I, I really never had needed. Uh, I never was hungry. We always had food. But we was always turning out to waste food if we talk about food. And to the fact that we were kind of picky with food, liver, couldn't stand liver. But we, was, we had to eat it anyway. <laughs> so uh, the thing is, all my life I, 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 I never needed anything really. I thought I did, but when I got older, I really, I really didn't have the need compared to some people. But I guess the blessing that I had in my whole family is that my parents raised us in the church, raised us in the word, raised us in the church, put that foundation for us because as we get older, all the material things means nothing. And the fact that um, where we are spiritually, that's the most blessing it is. That, that, that's, that's, you know, where it's, really where it is. It's, it's your relationship with God and doing his will the best you can and share with others. Amen. So I was just very thankful that we grew up in, grew up in the in the word and grew up in the church mm-hmm. and everything. Mm-hmm. And that, that really just the answer to all your problems if you believe that. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. no matter what problems I thought I had, uh, and I, I did I went through some ups and downs, but the Lord always brought me through. Always brought me through. Amen. I feel like Dave, I said, Man, I'm not the I'm, I'm that person out the guy's own heart. That's mm-hmm. how selfish I've felt because I always came through things yeah. and houses, whatever mm-hmm. the material stuff came easy, I thought, but yeah. but it means nothing. You know, yes. you have Christ in your heart, so. Amen, amen, amen. Brother Keith, you know I was. You got two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough time. But uh, I really thank God for where I am right now because where I've been was Satan is a trickster. Truly, truly a master of delusion, illusions. And I was caught up all up in it. Uh, for love, I, I went out for lust. For uh, money, I went out for grubbing money. I was, I was, uh, and, and in the world's eyes, you seem to think that that's okay. You know, grinding so hard and, and being you, you know, like the world says now, you're God. Your man is his own God, and that's the concept I have. You know, Daryl, we we are grounded in the. We have ministers on both sides of the aisle, mom's side and pop's side, yeah. and it's a good thing that we had that foundation, like Brother Jim was talking about. But it wasn't uh, taking hold. It wasn't, it was almost like, it was appalling to see how hard we had to struggle and make life a life worth smiling about. So the lesser end, like I said, Satan is a trickster. He'll make it seem all so swell. Oh yeah, you do a little bit of this. Oh, you here here comes money. Here come money. Here come that car. Here come that apartment. Here come, you know, everything else that comes with being doing the wrong things. But 
God has truly blessed me because he let me be chastised by Satan. I blame nothing on the Lord. Amen. I blame nothing. I blame his, I, I, I like to say that I thank him for his love, his security, his purpose, which I don't know yet, but uh, I just thank him for just being with me because, man, it, it's, it's wild out there in the world. It's wild and it's, it is a most leading uh, walk that you can walk. Everything looks good in the world. People walk up and, to get their awards, first giving honor to God, and next thing you know, they're at an illicit party doing something that they ain't supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I'm, I'm so thankful that God has given me, set my feet on solid ground. Mm -hmm. He has made me look up, not look down. He has made me just, you know, a hunger that's in me like I've never... We talk about hungry food. I'm talking about hunger for the spirit. Amen. I'm I'm talking about man. It's just, it's just. What if? What if? What if? What can I do to show God? What can I do to be better man for God? Amen. Amen. You know. So I, I that's I got a lot more, but two minutes is a little bit too <laughs> show. Amen. Amen. I just uh, anybody else? Anybody else? We're a little bit over tonight. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and, and wrap it up. I just, uh, we share just a praise report from our brother Charles Love. Brother Charles Love is retired Navy, and he's been going through a lot of health challenges. And uh, he was homeless for a while. And, uh, you know, we have been assisting here at Palomar. And just, I talked to him last night. He said, Brother Williams, I got visited by seven angels today. And I said, Brother Charles, what are you talking about, brother? And he says, well, Brother Williams, they was trying to kick me out of my place. They was telling me how far behind I was in, on my rent. They were trying to complain to me about, uh, you know, the furniture. I guess when he moved in, it was a partially furniture, furnished place. And they were just trying to find every way to pick on me, Brother Williams. And so I've been working with him, called a couple of agencies. We've been working for the past, I would say, past month. Uh, to try to settle the situation, but then he got visited by a man that works with uh, retired veterans or veterans in the Navy, and the man has a business where they take care of Navy people. And the man heard about Brother Charles, and he's the owner of the company, came and visited him in that morning, and Charles sat there and talked to him for about an hour. He told him about his love of God. He told him about Palomar Street Church of Christ. He talk, told him about how he'd been baptized. He told him how he was almost dead three months ago, sitting up in the hospital, and the man said, I'm going to help you. So he said, Brother Williams, the man was here an hour and a half. He said, an hour later, the man's wife came over, and she runs the business. And she sat down and talked with him and said how much the, the husband had, had talked about her. She said, I tell you what, you don't worry about nothing. He said, he talked to the wife, filled out some paperwork. A couple hours later, a nurse showed up. The nurse showed up and said, we're going to take care of you, took his, took, you know, his medications and got all that stuff straightened out. And she says, oh, yeah, you need a bed. And he says, we're going to get you a hospital bed. So a couple of hours later, people came over with, to, to hook up on a hospital bed. And just all this happened in one day. And so me and Charles were sitting there talking. This was last night. And I pulled over because he wanted to pray. I said, brother, let's pray. So we, I pulled over. And he was just so amazed at how God was working in his life from where he was a month or two ago, where he was on the brink of giving up. And then to tell me last night, by the way, I'm seven angels visited me today. And he was just so overjoyed. So I think all of this that we're learning about Job and, and, and what we're seeing in his friends, what we're seeing in Elihu, uh, and then what we're going to see when God shows up, you know, uh, we're just about there. I think what we might do, we may kind of end here. It's 34. It's some of the same passages repeat all the way through 37, and then God speaks up. So if you guys want to start reading 38, and uh, we'll, we'll end up you know, kind of wrapping it up here pretty soon. But we just wanted to uh, take a moment and give God his thanks and praise and, 
give him his glory and how his and talk about his righteousness. And that's, I think, what Elihu is trying to tell uh, the friends. Are there any prayer requests tonight? Any prayer requests? I don't have a prayer request, but I want to give thanks for uh, God allowing my siblings and my nieces and nephews to arrive here safely. Amen. Uh, without any harm. And so uh, just pray for us as we uh, move further into this uh, burial service for my father on Saturday. Amen. Amen. And we are praying our prayer request is for sunshine on Saturday. Uh, with that, let's go to prayer. Let's go to prayer. It's a little late. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we... Thank you, Father, so much for what you have done and what you continue to do, Father. We appreciate you so much, Father. And we wanted to take a little time tonight, Father, just to reflect on our own lives, reflect on, you know, how do we apply the lessons that we're learning? What do these things mean to me? How can I grow from this? How can I share with my loved ones? How can I... Uh, go through some of the things that I'm going through. Father, we just thank you so much for all that you have done, all you continue to do. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, just for allowing us to have a place where we can come together in peace and in love and share your word, Father, and just fellowship with one another, encourage one another, Father, by our shared experiences. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, those souls that are here, those that may not have been able to make it but are able to listen later online or however they may catch this program, Father. But we just thank you so much for all that you have done and all you continue to do. We know, Father, there are people that are still struggling with COVID-19, people are still struggling with health, people are still struggling financially. So, Father, we pray for them. We ask that you allow them to sometimes go through the things, even if you're quiet in their lives at this particular moment, we ask, Father, that they can hold on to you, Father, and trust you and continue to do what you would have them to do, Father. And we know, Father, that you will be there in the end. You said you would never leave us and you would never forsake us. So, Father, we thank you, and we know that there are those that are uh, in need of prayer, Father. We know you know who they are. You know their names. You know their situations, Father. We submit them to you, Father, humbly submit them to you. In Jesus' name we say, amen.